Gaurav Rajan, welcome to In Conversation. Thank you. Isn't a trade war between the US and China the very last thing that the world needs right now? Well, it's, uh, it's uh, all kinds of conflict building up, right? It's not just trade, it's investment. There is uh, some sort of poking around uh, on the strategic side. Yeah, it's, it's the last thing we need, uh, more uh, escalation of uh, a conflict between the two largest economies in the world. Um, you know, uh, there's no good time for such a conflict, but this is probably one of the worst times. Let's take just one of the many problems. First of all, let's look at poverty, because that has obviously been exacerbated by what's taking place with all of the COVID-19 lockdowns. Poor people are going to get even poorer, and the handouts that may come from government will not be enough. I mean, we're going to see probably quite a lot of that here in Asia, aren't we? Absolutely. The industrial countries, uh, by and large, have managed to help their populations. In fact, in the United States, if you look at consumption, uh, the lowest uh, segments of the income distribution have actually uh, maintained, if not increased their consumption as a result of the transfers that have been made during the pandemic. Now, first, that's not going to last even in industrial countries, but even in Europe, the um, sort of protection for workers, the uh, short work programs are going to come to an end. So uh, across the industrial world, with all the massive help that's been given, you are going to see increased levels of poverty. In emerging markets, that help has not been given. But yeah, many families are going to slip from the lower middle class into poverty. And, uh, you know, they're scared. Uh, they, some of it may come down to issues like, do they have enough to eat? Uh, and that's, that's worrisome because uh, unless we see a revival of economies, uh, a revival of jobs, uh, this is going to be uh, a, a big issue uh, as we progress. Isn't that though a real tragedy? Because so much of the incredible progress of lifting people out of poverty over the last 20 years, is that going to be knocked back? Absolutely. Uh, the worry here is not of a year or two, which we talked about earlier, but of a lost decade. I mean, think about a family which has to pull its kids out of school because they can't afford the school fees anymore because they're trying to put food on the table. Those kids pulled out of school early. Earlier, they used to you know, go at least to high school. Now they've left at fourth, fifth, or sixth grade, and their schooling is uh, disrupted. In fact, they will never go back to school. And that's condemning the next generation to a greater uh, poverty than, than uh, would have been the case if, uh, if things had been, if the pandemic hadn't occurred. But Prof Rajan, what do you mean by a lost decade? Well, for some, it's already on the cards, right? Because uh, in some countries, the relief efforts to poorer families have been sporadic, have uh, there are lots of gaps, and there are families that are really hurting. Uh, Latin America is a case in point. South Asia is another case. Uh, there are uh, real problems in these, in these countries. The true extent of the problem is not visible right now because it's very hard to go out there and see what's going on given the pandemic has still not been contained. But we will start seeing the consequences down the line in school enrollments, in, in uh, many children taken out of schools and so on. And uh, even if they get back into school, a couple of uh, a year or more uh, in a environment where they haven't learned uh, and they're, they're damaged. Uh, so I, I, I worry that this is something that is already on the cards for some people. The key question is, can we limit the extent of the damage that is done? It's hard to see a simple answer, right? Because until you get the lock, uh, until you get the pandemic uh, sort of properly contained, jobs will not come back. I mean, many people have service sector jobs, whether they're working in restaurants or in hotels or for the tourist, tourism industry. These are industries that employ a lot of moderately skilled people. And if you don't have control on the pandemic, nobody is going to uh, patronize these services. And so you don't have the jobs in the first place. 
so it, it's not a simple choice between lives and livelihoods. Uh, clearly, both matter. But you need to find a way to tackle the pandemic even while you're giving opportunities for people to earn livelihoods. And that requires a tremendous amount of careful management of the, uh, of the virus itself, um, you know, ensuring uh, reasonable amounts of social distancing, even if you don't have an entire lockdown, ensuring that people can get to workplaces that are reasonably safe, um, you know, perhaps focusing on keeping the elderly a lot more protected while allowing the young who have more uh, sort of uh, ability to handle the virus uh, greater greater freedom. Uh, so these are things that have to be cleverly thought out, also cleverly managed. And unfortunately, many countries don't have the management capacity. Prof Rajan, that's very easy to say that you want to have social distancing and so on. But in all of the major cities of the world, be it Tokyo, Mumbai, Singapore, we are densely populated. So it's unrealistic to really say that you're going to be able to maintain these social distancing and yet have the economy really move. For sure, it's going to be hard. And, and this is where you have to be clever about it, right? So even in a poor country like India, even in the world's uh, greatest uh, slum, uh, Dharavi in Mumbai, they have managed to bring some control uh, to, the, uh, to the pandemic through a variety of measures, including uh, you know, neighborhood watches and this and that. And as you rightly point out, the problem in emerging markets is, and developing countries is quite different from industrial countries. In, imposing the same kind of lockdown is not gonna work in part because the public services that are meant to operate during the lockdown are not as effective in uh, the emerging markets in developing countries as in the industrial countries. So we need to find our own unique solutions, which means a process of muddling through as we figure out what works, but then implementing it quite effectively when we do find that out. you back to the US-China relations. I mean, if we're looking at the development, though, economically, China seems to be in a really sharp bounce back. They may actually even have a V-shaped recovery. Is the gap between America and China going to widen now? Well, China is not an island. China depends on demand from the rest of the world also. And right now, production is back. But if uh, consumption in the rest of the world remains tepid, China will eventually find a problem because it will be producing too much without appropriate markets to absorb that production. So it's extremely important for China that the rest of the world come back in a strong way and absorb what it is able to produce. The Chinese, of course, have been very good at uh, sort of bringing their, uh, containing the virus and then bringing their economy back uh, kudos to them. Some of it has been uh, done by relying on uh, on some of the old tools they always had, which is uh, increased credit expansion, increase uh, you know spending on real estate and construction, and so on. Uh, and that eventually creates problems. So uh, I think they will want external demand to take up some of the uh, some of the uh, demand rather than try and pump up local demand in in unsustainable ways. But I also think the Chinese, while having done a lot on, the, um, on getting the economy back, haven't managed the geopolitical uh, sort of uh, spillovers as well. And that's important because uh, I, I don't think uh, sort of the US administration is solely to blame for the kind of conflictual situation we see now between the two largest economies in the world. I think the Chinese also have had a hand in, in the kinds of issues they have pursued, 
Uh, and uh, and I think it is it is important that both sides dial back because this is the worst time, as you said, uh, as we started out, to have a trade and investment conflict. Do you think, though, there's going to be a difference depending on who gets into the White House after November? Well, I, I think once the election is over, uh, any administration has to recognize it's in there for, for at least four years and has to figure out how to get the economy back on track. And so uh, I would suspect that, uh, you know, there will be um, a rethink of the relationship and how to focus on the issues that are, are sources of friction while letting the issues that are not sources of friction sort of uh, uh, run more smoothly. Now, uh, I think uh, one of the complaints about the current US administration is its lack of cohesion and lack of coherence because there are multiple views being reflected which come to the fore at different times. And one possibility with a Biden administration is there's more uh, of a coherence as well as a rethink. The Biden, uh, possible Biden administration can back off from the current sort of uh, headbutting that's going on, uh, take a fresh view, but it may come back with a more uh, sort of uh, coalitional structure, uh, taking uh, sort of the Europeans, the Japanese along with it, in a discussion of the relationship. So I think there is a possibility for an improvement, even while it doesn't necessarily mean that the US will back off from its longstanding uh, concerns. Under a Biden administration? Under a Biden administration, possibly even under a Trump administration, if there's a, if there's a rethink. But again, there's greater promise in the, in the Biden administration for a smoother renegotiation because the Biden administration is not doesn't carry the baggage of the immediate past. What about uh, other economists than yourself who argue that the gap between US and China as economies is going to widen even further because the Chinese have a very strong manufacturing base and that's what uh, is doing very well now and can actually bear a certain amount of the social distancing. Well, manufacturing is still uh, only a fraction of the Chinese economy. But uh, a much larger yes. fraction than the U.S. It's more than the U.S., but it's, it's, it's I think, still, uh, you know, in the 30% in the region rather than um, services, even in China, have increased considerably in the last uh, few years. Uh, but I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, the greater challenge for China will be having reached the technology frontier in some areas, how does it maintain uh, itself at the frontier? The future can be a, a future of China, yes, uh, certainly becoming the biggest economy in the world, but not outpacing the rest unless it has a tremendous growth in intellectual property in, in, uh, in ideas at the frontier, something which the US already can do. the lockdowns around the world, putting the global economy into a coma. Is it time for us to wake up from that coma? Well, the idea of coma was uh, we'd tackle the disease in short order. And, and, you know, Europe has done it effectively. China did it. East Asia has largely done it. Uh, there are some outbreaks here and there, but it's largely been successful. And there are countries that haven't tackled it. Uh, the US uh, is uh, example one, but India, Brazil, um, you know, much of Latin America, these are countries that haven't contained the virus. And so for those countries, I mean, continuing lockdowns are enormously costly. And so they have to become clever of sort of managing the, the virus, ensuring it doesn't expand but at the same time trying to open up in a way that people, uh, at least some people can sort of earn a living. And uh, again, you talked about services earlier in countries that are developed, a lot of people can stay at home and do their jobs. In developing countries, far fewer can. So it's sort of, this, is, this uh, virus is, is sort of an anti-Robin Hood. It does, it hits the poor even harder 
on every front and then the rich. But, but given that, I think many countries have to think about how they allow these people to generate their livelihoods, even while uh, sort of focusing on containing the virus. If we look at what the IMF is predicting, they're saying that this year is going to be terrible, but next year may creep forward. Now, you're on the external you know, group of advisors advising the IMF. Do you agree with that? Well, everything depends on the progress of the virus and our efforts in combating it, right? Uh, so to some extent, if uh, next year, we, we've managed to contain the virus this year, and next year is a period of recovery, almost surely it's going to be far better than this year, and, uh, you know, a substantial pickup in the pace of growth. If we haven't contained the virus, if there are second waves, if in addition, we don't find a vaccine which is safe, which can be rolled out reasonably easily, uh, we may see not just a continuation of current conditions, but also dealing with the uh, problems that have built up over this time. Companies which are highly levered, companies that have to go through bankruptcy, a cessation in the kinds of help that have been given to households because the amount of help that is given can't run at this pace for a sustained period of time. So yes, uh, if, if uh, things turn out really badly, uh, it may not be so rosy next year. What about a polemical suggestion, at least on the money side? You've been a central bank governor, so what about just printing the money? Printing the money to be able to give these handouts and not worry too much about the consequences later on, because what's really needed now is an emergency that we've never faced before. So why don't central banks just do that, particularly in, in developing countries? They could. Uh, provided uh, that people sort of have faith in, in the currency and uh, they believe that there will be some uh, return to fiscal health down the line. Uh, if you print money with no constraints, uh, you may create a inflation, hyperinflation problem uh, over and above the pandemic problem. So you don't want to create a macroeconomic problem at the same time. So I think the central banks that are sensible will work with their governments and say, look, I can finance you uh, in the short run, but you've got to set in place uh, norms for how you will return to fiscal uh, sort of uh, health over the medium term. Otherwise, uh, all I'm doing is helping you jump over the cliff. Uh, and that, that's not particularly useful for either of us or for the country. The amounts, though, that are going into these stimulus packages, particularly from developed countries, is in the trillions, significant trillions. Are we all digging a hole of debt that is going to be very, very difficult to climb out of again? Because many of these stimulus packages don't even have any promise of repayment. You know, it's been taken out of the coffers, but there's no promise that it's going to be put back in. I mean, almost surely this debt will not be paid by our generation it is gonna be paid by future generations. And what is worrisome is we're not making that calculus that in fact, uh, we have to obviously preserve the productive capacity of the economy because that's gonna be handed over to the next generations. But we also need to ask, well, how much pain are we willing to take ourselves? Because if we assume just because we can borrow, we borrow 
in such a way as to preclude all future borrowing by future generations because we've handed to them such a pile of debt. Uh, that's not reasonable and fair to them because they will have their problems. They will have their pandemics. They will have their financial crises for which we've left no borrowing space. And also we've left them our legacy problems, paying for our retirement, which many industrial countries haven't funded, as well as the fact that we've left the biggest sort of issue facing the globe, climate change, unaddressed, which will require enormous investments. So I, I think uh, even countries that have the borrowing capacity have to be careful. If we look six months from now, we're looking into 2021. Are you optimistic or pessimistic, Prof Rajan? I think we will uh, start a process of, uh, of recovery. I mean, we've already started it, uh, but I think it will be at very different paces across the world. And there will be, you know, things, there will be crisis spots. Uh, we've sort of papered over all of this so far, but I have no doubt that our ability to paper over will become more and more difficult. And so even as we have a recovery, we will have uh, you know, those, those places which are in deep, deep trouble. So a more chaotic, uneven world. For sure, uh, which, uh, which certainly raises the premium uh, on, uh, on leadership, on bottom-up uh, uh, sort of efforts. Uh, hopefully, uh, it becomes the catalyst which allows us to go to a better world. Prof Rajan, thank you very much for being on In Conversation. Thank you.